morning I've got a couple things I want to share with you. And as I think about those things, I think about what it means for those principles to be applied to all of our lives. I want to understand the power of humility. I want to understand the power of sharing with others. And I want to understand the power and respect the power of wickedness to influence my life. See, we're up against a lot of things. And most of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, will say the world revolves around me. I'm the center of my universe. <laughs> Humility does not come naturally to most of us. If it does to you, then that's an indication that it doesn't. <laughs> most of us want what we want, and sharing with others is difficult. And most of us underestimate the power of darkness and the influence it can have on our lives. And the text we have this morning comes from a story, an ancient story, the story of Abraham or Abram and Lot. Abraham had traveled to the promised land, and the land that God had promised him, and because of the famine in that area, had made his way down to Egypt and then back up from Egypt to the land that God had promised. He traveled all of that journey with one of his nephews, a man by the name of Lot. And their herds had become so vast and they had become so wealthy from the uh, ways that they were doing animal husbandry that there was so many animals that there wasn't room enough for all the animals to be together in one place. And so the herders between Abram and Lot began to argue with each other and even began to fight over the best grazing lands. So Abram, or Abraham, came to his nephew Lot and said these words to him in Genesis chapter 13. So Abram said to Lot, Let us not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Nobody fights like family. <laughs> if you have problems in your life, a lot of them will start with how your family loves each other. And it will affect you your entire life how your family treats each other. And if you are ever going to evidence humility and sharing, it needs to be within your own family. You see, this whole sermon series came out of a book by Robert Fulgram called Something Along the Lines of Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And I began to think about what it means to have a childlike faith before God. Not to be a child. Because I think we should be maturing every year. I think every year our families should be closer to each other and love each other more. I think every year the people around us should see us mature. Not to continue to be immature children, but to have a childlike faith. Understand the difference of what I'm talking about. Because the childlike faith says, I will trust you, Abba Father, with everything I have. And so think about for just a moment, as I pause for the reading of the word, what it means for you to live a life of humility and sharing and righteousness in your family. It is not the whole land before you, Abraham continued. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Abraham wasn't a right winger or a left winger. He was just somebody who wanted to love his family. And a lot of times the politics of our culture have interfered with the family relationships that we have. And as Christians, we should only have one goal, and that is to build the kingdom of God. 
that we would pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, or your kingdom come, or your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not the least bit interested in anything else but what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And in the kingdom of heaven, there's ways we live before each other. Now, I want to talk a lot about Lot today because his story interests me. And the reason why his story interests me is because he made a lot of the same compromises that we have the temptations to make. He did a lot of the things that some of us would say, you know, that's pretty smart. You see, because the first thing is, Abraham was the uncle and probably the older man. And if Lot would have been the man he should have been, he would have said to his uncle Abraham, I've been following you because of your blessing. I've been blessed. And I tell you what, uncle, Uncle Abe, I don't know if he called him that. Why don't you tell me? And I will defer to you. Because as your nephew, it's been a privilege for us to travel together for these years. And I've been blessed to follow you as a man of God and, and to follow in your example and see the things that God has blessed you with. So I want to learn from you, uncle. How do you want to handle this? You tell me. As a matter of fact, uncle, if you want, if you want me to, to go over here, I'll go over here. You just tell me where to go and I'll go there. That would have been the proper attitude. And here's the thing. I relate to Lot. I don't want you to think that, I, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm just beaten up on Lot because I relate to him. Because sometimes in my own heart, I find the same selfishness in me. You know, what you want is fine, but what I want is really important. And so many times in our families and how we love each other, if we're not careful, we will fall into this same trap of not understanding the power of humility in our family relationships. If I have to humble myself before you in order for us to be able to get along, then I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it for Jesus. Because he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That's humility. And as long as I don't have to die on a cross for you, I'm willing to be humble. Dying on a cross might be a step too far right now. But if you're in my family and, and, and you're trying to do what's right and we're trying to work together and we've got a problem, let's work it out from a humble heart. In your relationships and in your families, it'll make all the difference in the world if you'll just take a step back and say, you know what, it doesn't have to be about me. It can be about us and what it looks like for us to live together and love each other. It doesn't have to be about my ego. And here's the thing, even if you're right, <laughs> especially when you're right, learn the power of humility and humbling yourself and saying, you know what, how do we make this work together? But Lot didn't do that. Instead, what he did is he looked around and he saw over in the distance as they were talking and he'd been traveling that there was this place down next to the Jordan River that was green, had all the grass that his sheep could eat, and it was it was it was. It was called in the Bible in one place, the well-watered plains of Jordan. Perfect. Not a problem. So he tells his uncle, okay, I'm going over there to the good stuff. From a agriculture or husbandry, animal husbandry point of view, that was the place to be. So Abraham said, no problem. And he took his family and his herds of flocks to the less desirable places and made it work. And that brings me to my next thought. Lot was not overly concerned about taking the best for himself. 
And if we don't understand the power of humility, what then becomes how we live is this constant grasping. This constant sense of greed. And greed is a soul-warping disease. It will warp you to do things you never thought you'd do and think ways you never thought you'd think, especially in your family. Now, I, <laughs> I have a beef with my brother Ben. And it's not going away. And if my brother Ben is watching... You got it coming, brother. <laughs> because a year ago, on April 25th, my mother made me a cherry pie. A cherry pie that only she can make with the right crust and the right filling and everything perfect. And unfortunately, because of a family situation... I was not able to meet up with my mother on that day. And so my pie was sitting there at my mom's house. My brother Ben knew because of my travel schedule I wasn't going to be able to come by and pick up the pie like I'd originally planned. And so on my birthday, my brother Ben took the best for himself. And he got his kids lined up next to him, two of them, and they videotaped themselves eating my cherry pie. And as he ate the pie, he looked into the camera and he said, Matt, I think this is one of the best cherry pies mom has ever made. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my family. <laughs> now, that is a silly example. But there are so many ways in which that happens for real in our lives. And families stop talking to each other. Families stop loving each other the way they should. Families get torn apart by these simple little ways of not learning how to be the way God wants us to be. And here's the thing. Lot chose the best and took the best for himself. And as he did that, his life began this slow, gradual creep towards total chaos. Because as he chose the well-watered plains of Jordan and that beautiful scenery that laid out in front of him and he took all that for himself and his uncle Abram went up to the less desirable places and made it work, he began to get into one problem after the next. One situation after the next. One circumstance after the next. As a matter of fact, in the very next chapter, because he had chosen the well-watered plains of Jordan, he had also chosen a place that was close to some very wicked cities one of them called Sodom, the other called Gomorrah. And some kings had come down to fight against those two cities. And he was caught in the middle. And his whole family got taken captive. And what happened? Uncle Abram to the rescue. So Abraham had to come and rescue Lot, bring him back, settle him down again in the well-watered plains of Jordan because he didn't have enough sense to say, Uncle Abram, I'm sorry, I blew this. He didn't have the common sense to say, you know what, I, I should have done this better, uncle. Would you teach me how to do this better? But no, as we find him living in those well-watered plains of Jordan and looking up at the cities, all of a sudden there became an attraction to no longer live the way he'd been living. All of a sudden those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah started looking pretty good. And the next thing you know, he's not just camped outside the cities, he's living in the city. And the next thing you know, angels of the Lord are coming to Abraham saying, Abraham, we're going to destroy these two cities. 
And Abraham knows his nephew is down there, and he begins to appeal to the Lord and say, God, if there's just ten people, or just you know, five people, or two people, or however many people, would you spare the city? And finally, it came down to that, we will not spare the cities, but we will try to spare Lot and his family. You see, he'd gone on this whole transition of making bad choices that were not necessarily based on things that he couldn't have done or even shouldn't have done, but he had the wrong spirit in his heart to begin with. He didn't have a heart of humility. He wasn't concerned about taking the best for himself. And the last thing is that he wasn't nearly as concerned as he should have been about the influence of wickedness on his family. And because of that, he no longer was a man his family could follow. He was no longer a man his family could trust in. He was no longer a man that could lead his family. Why? Because he had compromised in all these different ways. He'd begun to compromise in all these different ways of thinking, and he had never gotten to the place he needed to be where he could lead his family as a man of God. So his wife suffered. And everybody gives his wife a hard time. As they were leaving Sodom after Sodom was being destroyed, we had this great story in the Bible about how Lot and his daughters and, and his wife were fleeing, being led by the angel of the Lord. When they got over that last hill, just before they could no longer see Sodom, the story is that Lot's wife turned around and looked one last time. Don't blame her. Blame Lot. Because he was no longer a man she could follow. Because he was not living up to the person he needed to be. His family was destroyed. And in a cave, in suffering and perdition and incest, his legacy lived on through his daughters. And I'll let you read the story. It's a terrible story about the way he ended up. About the way his children ended up about he, how he ended up and the legacy that he could have had as part of the family of one of the greatest men who ever lived in ancient times. Instead, he becomes a footnote in history of what not to do, of how not to live, and how not to be. And so in your family, not just as a man, but as a woman now, think about the blessing that you can have as a righteous woman of God, to humble yourself and to say it doesn't have to be all about me, to choose that which is best for your family, not just what's best for you. And then finally, and I think this is really important, to not underestimate the power of of wickedness over your family. Do not allow your family to get so close to the edge of where right and wrong have this red line. <laughs> because we live in a society and in a culture that is being destroyed from the inside out. More single mothers are raising children than any other single definable household. Women by themselves raising children, the number one household in the United States. That should not be. But it is because of the breakdown of the family being destroyed by the enemy from the inside out. If a woman or a man does not do drugs or drink, they're in the top 1% of society. I'm a one percenter. And I'm not a hell's angel. <laughs> Just those two simple things. Don't do drugs. Don't get drunk. And you would think that in our minds, we would say, well, if that's all we have to stop doing, then let's stop doing it right now. 
Why would we give our society over to that? In the Church of the Nazarene, we were at the forefront of prohibition. Pasadena, California was the first dry city in the United States because of the efforts of Phineas Brzee and the Church of the Nazarene in no small part. Let me tell you something. I'm still holding that same standard. I have not given up on that. <laughs> because I believe that if, if we will just do some simple things, we can make our lives so much better. We could change the world around us. You say, oh, Pastor Matt, it's not a problem to drink a little bit once in a while. Well, then stop. <laughs> is it going to be a negative thing? No, the doctors are showing us that, that drinking in excess is worse, is just as bad or worse for you than smoking. And it's cool not to smoke now. Well, let's keep going. Let's make it cool not to drink. It's simple stuff. But the chaos that has happened in our families, the chaos that's happened in our culture, there was a reason why enough of us as Americans decided it was a bad idea to drink at all. <laughs> Man, Pastor Matt, you have quit preaching and gone to meddling. You're into our lives now. No, listen, if, I'm not saying that drinking is a sin. Don't hear me saying that. But neither is taking the best. For yourself. Neither is not having a lot. I mean, Abraham offered him the choice. He did not sin by taking the well watered plains of Jordan. He sinned when he allowed himself to get so close to wickedness that he began to embrace wickedness and live with wickedness and live in that way where he could not no longer he could no longer be blessed by God. And it was a slow, steady stream of decisions that brought him to that place. And so I'm calling us as a church and as a community to think about these stories and come to God with a childlike faith and say, God, help me to trust you for my future. Help me to not accept any compromises in my life. Help me to live in such a way that I can be a blessing to my community and to the people around me and to live a life in the saving and sanctifying grace of what it means to live before God. God saves us, but he doesn't want to just leave us where we're at. He wants to transform us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to be with us and help us as we live our lives for him. And so I'm living in that grace today. And I want us to just think just briefly as I close about these three concepts I've been trying to teach this morning. Here are the three concepts that I want you to take with you today. Humility is the hallmark of a man or woman who will ultimately receive God's best. You cannot receive God's best unless you learn how to be humble before God. Generosity always comes back in a harvest of blessing. Generosity always comes back in a harvest of blessing. Abram was generous with his nephew. And because of his generosity... He received a harvest of blessing. And then the final thing, you cannot live too close to wickedness or it eventually will corrupt you. Can't do it. Atmosphere determines outcome. <laughs> what you're around is what you will become. And so God help us to apply these lessons from Lot's life so that his life was not in vain. So that what he went through and what he experienced, we can learn from. Do you want to make all your own mistakes or do you want to learn from other people's mistakes and not do those things? I tell you what, I want to learn from other people's mistakes and then not do that. <laughs> I, I just think to myself, God help me to live in such a way that I can receive all of the blessing that you want to give me. God help me not to put one thing between me and you as the old song says, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world's elusive dreams. Nothing presenting the least of your favor. Help me keep the way clear and let nothing between. Amen? Amen. That's, why, that's how it's supposed to work. Why would I want to put anything in God's way for him to bless me? 
I'd have to be stuck on stupid to do that. And so as a church, as a community, let's do the things that God can bless us with and live in such a way that we don't have to apologize to God at the end of the day for how we lived. That we can rejoice in what it means to serve God and love each other. And so as, as we do that this week, let's live into the power of humility. Let's live into the power of generosity. And let's keep ourselves as far away as we can from the corruption and wickedness of this world so we can live a life that God can bless. Would you stand together with me as we close our service today? I don't know where you're at in life, but I never end a service without giving you an opportunity to respond to God's call and where he might be leading you and what you might want to do this morning. So we sang a chorus a little bit earlier, and I want to sing it again. That first verse of Amazing Grace. And if you want to come and you want to say, God, help me to be humble. God, help me to be generous. God, help me to walk as far away from wickedness as I can. I want you to come and just say that to the Lord this morning. We'll have a closing prayer as we sing this great testimony to God's grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. If you want to come, come. At save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. It's a simple faith. It's a relationship with you, Lord. Abba Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to be in your presence today. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be with every person here, standing here with me, that we would learn from these stories of the Bible, that we would apply these principles and these truths to our heart, that we would live before you in such a way that God can bless us and help us. And Lord, I am so weary of the destruction that's happening in our families and in our homes and in our lives. And I pray, God, that you would help us to learn some of these lessons from Lot and learn how to leave a legacy behind us that matters, that we will live before you in such a way that we can find your blessing over our lives. And Lord, I just pray for us as we're here today that you would humble our hearts before you, that you would help us to live in a spirit of generosity, and that you would help us to live so close to you that nothing else gets in the way. Lord, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. And I ask, Lord, your blessing over this congregation. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord would make his face to shine upon you. I pray that the Lord would turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shake hands with at least five people and have a great week. God bless you. (laughs) 